Good evening and welcome, everybody. I'm John Racanelli, CEO of the National Aquarium, and I can't tell you how happy I am to welcome you all to this very special evening. Whether you're joining us in person or via Facebook, we're very glad to have you with us. And I want to note that this is the first such in-person event that we've hosted in nearly two years. Um, <laughs> If there's anyone who's worth the wait, it's the incomparable Dr. Sylvia Earle. Yeah. Need I say more? <laughs> Sylvia is going to share with us her lifetime of, of work exploring the deep frontier. And she's going to give us a couple snippets of, 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 of looks at her new book entitled National Geographic Ocean, A Global Odyssey. Um, which arrived in bookstores just two weeks ago. So this is truly hot off the press. I saw it for the first time an hour ago. Um, in this remarkable book, though, we get a clear picture of the ocean's tremendous impact on our lives, our future, and through the eyes of one of its greatest champions. And just as Sylvia is, we at the National Aquarium are focused on our vision to fundamentally change the way humanity both views and cares for our life-giving ocean. And that's what you're gonna hear about tonight from Sylvia. That's why we're here, to learn, inquire, connect, and most importantly, to take meaningful action because action is needed. I urge you to listen carefully to what Sylvia has to say this evening and also in this book, for she's one of the ocean's biggest advocates and truly an expert on what we can and must do to protect that ocean, what she so rightly calls our life support system. And as she'll tell us, it's the only one we have. Before I invite Sylvia to the stage, I'd like to thank some important people and organizations, and I'll ask you to hold your applause till the end. First, to Barbara Brannell Grogan, who's down in front, and the National Geographic Society. Yeah, hey, didn't you hear my instructions? <laughs> I'm not gonna try and stop you from expressing appreciation. Sylvia's publisher and collaborator for so many years, and in fact, the Society made Sylvia one of its first explorers in residence, which is a distinction that she still holds to this day. I'd also like to thank Mission Blue, of which Sylvia is chair and president, which for the last 15 years has provided the organizational support for Sylvia's advocacy and exploration of the ocean. Without the partnership of these two organizations, tonight's event could not have been possible, but there's more. That can also be said for the National Aquarium's Marjorie Lynn Bank Endowment Fund, created by the Bank family back in 1996 to help the aquarium fulfill its conservation mission while honoring the fine underwater photography of Marjorie Lynn Bank herself, who left this world far too soon. So in addition to our gratitude to the Bank family, I'd also like to acknowledge our entire aquarium family of members and donors and friends whose support make it possible for us to pursue our mission to inspire conservation of the world's aquatic treasures. We have two important community partners in the house tonight as well. <clears throat> the Ivy Bookshop is an independent bookseller here in Baltimore and a Baltimore institution. They're our retail partner tonight. Uh, they're offering signed copies of Dr. Earl's book for sale in the lobby after she speaks, and we're pleased to be working with the Ivy. And I'm beyond pleased to thank one of our favorite community partners for being here tonight, the Black Girls Dive Foundation, which works to bring freedom, equality, and opportunity to ocean science, while cultivating a new and diverse generation of scientists, conservationists, and planetary stewards. As you know, you Black Girls Dive members, you have a great friend in Dr. Earl who is herself both a pioneer and a breaker of glass ceilings. I'm also pleased to recognize the chair of our board of directors, Mark Bunting, and our incoming chair, Ted Weiss. I wanna thank you both for being here tonight and showing your leadership. And then finally, and most importantly, our National Aquarium staff and volunteers both those in attendance and watching from home. I'm proud of every one of you, and I believe there's no more dedicated or caring team on the face of this earth. So now let's give them all a big hand. <laughs> okay, so I believe you're all aware that Dr. Earl will be answering your questions after her talk. And this includes our Facebook audience as well, so tonight, for the in-person audience, we're using a pretty cool new app called Slido um, to collect your questions. Here's how it works. You grab your smartphone, you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, um, type in the event code, which is hashtag Sylvia, 
Um, or you can scan that QR code that you see on the screen. Um, and for our friends joining us from home, just drop your questions into the Facebook comments and we'll pull them out and get them on the Slido platform for you. Once you're in Slido, you can type in your questions and you can vote to boost questions that other people submit. Very democratic. Let me move on to our esteemed colleague and friend because that's why you're here tonight. I've had the very good fortune to have known Sylvia Earle for 35 years, ever since I was nine and she was 11. <laughs> and this is true, we first met when she came to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and tried to sell us a submarine. We actually ended up leasing it. Back in those days, I leased my car, my boat, my house. Um, it, actually, that, that very seminal visit in 1985 when Sylvia was trying to get ex energy around Deep Rover, a manned or womaned submersible that she had uh, been involved in the creation of, uh, that led to the very first manned exploration of Monterey Bay, which in turn inspired the creation of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, a major scientific institution that exists to this day. Many years and many dives later, Sylvia asked me to help her launch Mission Blue and to assist her in bringing the ocean into the geo-browser Google Earth, which unfortunately at that point was still Google Dirt until Sylvia got a hold of Google and said, you gotta fix this. And we did. And it was one of the most inspiring and exciting projects of my career. Eventually, Sylvia figured out where the talent really lies in the Racanelli family. And two years ago, she enlisted my spouse, Susan, as her philanthropy consultant and director of development. So I guess we've come a full circle. But Sylvia's work has spanned decades, continents, nations, and entire industries. And she's long been recognized as one of the world's top ocean scientists and explorers, and most importantly, its most ardent defender. It'll be no surprise to you that her advocacy continues unabated. Sylvia only recently returned from COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, where she made a compelling case for banning industrial scale fishing on the high seas. Today, her work is focused on creating an ever-growing network of hope spots special aquatic places that deserve attention and protection, and about which I have no doubt you'll be learning more in the next hour. And while she holds many world diving records and a litany of firsts in her amazing career, Sylvia cares little for titles, but much for the fishes, for the phytoplankton and the zooplankton and the cetaceans and the cephalopods and the elasmobranchs and the three million other species with whom, with whom we share this precious water planet. As she reminds us at every chance, each of those fellow Earthlings deserves its place in the ecosystem too. So it's with great honor and pleasure that I invite you to join me in a true Charm City welcome to her deepness, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Thank you, John, for that generous introduction. I have to say the circles keep moving. There are more and more circles coming, <laughs> onward and downward, as they say. <laughs> and thank all of you for, for coming tonight and letting me be a part of the action here in the fish house <laughs> in, this, in this part of the planet. It is really a moment in time. A lot of bad news out there, but I think of this time, early in the 21st century, that we all share as the unprecedented sweet spot. I mean, there are plenty of reasons to feel overwhelmed with the problems, but imagine if we did not know that there were problems and we just blindly went on doing the same kinds of things that have propelled us through time to get to this place, consuming nature as if we'd never run out. Well, now we know what was not possible to see or understand as recently as when I was a kid, which was not that recent, I guess. But, <laughs> but when you think about it, geologically speaking, we are all newcomers resting lightly on this deep time. It's taken a long time for Earth 
to become habitable for us. It's taken us a very short time to kind of unravel the systems that in a universe that's really not very friendly to really make Earth not as friendly as it was when I was a child and certainly when my parents were kids. So the image I'm about to show there is one that kids of today are, are growing up with this realization of what the planet looks like from far away. It wasn't possible when I was a kid. I had a chance to meet Bill Anders, the astronaut who took the, that image that is iconic, Earthrise, that first image of Earth from far, far away in December 1968. But Bill Anders says this is really his favorite image of Earth because it really brings home the fact that the world is blue. A lot of people never see the ocean, never touch the ocean, and don't realize that with every breath you take, every drop of water you drink, the ocean is touching you. But that's changing. Now we know what could not be known not so long ago. And that's why this, this is that magical time, the sweet spot, as never before, we're armed with a superpower of knowing as never again will we have a chance as good as what we have right now to take this time that I certainly have experienced and you have too, of this planetary decline with the air, the water, the fabric of life is degrading because of our actions, largely. So what are we going to do about it? Well, if we didn't know that it was happening, we wouldn't even try to figure it out. But we not only know that it is happening, we know what to do. The real problem now is doing it, is really having the gumption, the courage, to understand there's some things to get from where we are, to get to a better place, we have to change. And you know, some people say, well, it's just not possible. We've, we're so set on our ways. But look at 2020. That was a time when we didn't imagine that we could change the way we have. But here we are, wearing masks, curtailing travel, changing our habits in ways that once we know that everything we care about is on the line, that our very lives are threatened, we, we're willing to do what it takes to get to a better place. We have this other big issue called climate change and another one, the loss of the diversity of life, the changing chemistry of the planet, not just the changing temperature. And we can do something about it. We know what to do. And over the next few minutes, <laughs> I want to share the view. And certainly during the little break that I shared with most of the rest of the world, a chance to hunker down and reflect on who we are, where we have come from, where we might be going, with a lot of help from many allies, including especially in the front row down here, Barbara Brownell. Stand up, Barbara. Wave your arms. <laughs> My long-term ally, partner, intellectual source of imagination, um, whatever it is, thank you, Barbara, <laughs> for being there. N not only for the, this new tome, Ocean, a Global Odyssey, but the odyssey that we have shared over many years of trying to get a grip on what's happening to the ocean. And in this special little break, 2019 to the present time, to have a chance to actually look at what's happening in a way that, you know, you get so busy doing all sorts of things that you just wish you had time to catch up on who knows what about the changes, to dive into the knowledge that has been accumulating more learned about the nature of the world, 
literally since the middle of the 20th century than during all preceding history, certainly about the ocean, the greatest era of exploration so far, but really it's just beginning. Lucky kids coming along. This is, there's so much to look forward to. And at the same time, sadly, the greatest time of loss. But there's also something to look forward to there because now we know. We know what to do to recover. We can never go back to what was, but we can certainly make the world better, safer, stronger, because of what we now do armed with knowledge. So, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago in human history that we didn't know what air was. What's air? It's, it's just invisible, it's just there. But people who, like little kids, started asking questions. What is air? I'm trying to figure it out, and they determined that it's, you know, 80% nitrogen, about 20% oxygen, just enough carbon dioxide to power photosynthesis in the good old days, and now a little too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and other substances that we have released into the air that we once thought, yeah, it's infinite. You can put anything into the air you want to, it'll just go away. Like the same attitude we've had about the ocean. And knowing that it's an ocean of air, and the ocean, is a continuation, like it's one big system, and all of it held together and influenced by the fact that it, Earth is not just rocks and water. It's a living system. Now we know, and we can see the world with new eyes, new understanding, and understand, as we could not when I was a child, that it's, it is changing naturally, that continents have moved around. And that was one of the fun things about writing the, the book or gathering information and letting the book basically write itself about what do we know about how continents were formed, how they've come apart, what underlies the continents, what, where did the ocean come from, what is, what is water? And, and what, what about the other materials that are in the ocean. Where did the salt come from? There are a lot of stories and myths, but by diving into the latest and greatest insights that people have, have come up with and now sharing in an unprecedented way, it's just so cool to be a 21st century human being and to be able to dive into this, this ocean of knowledge that now exists that did not and could not exist when I was a kid. The technology to go high in the sky or deep in the sea did not exist. Understanding of the importance, not only of trees, grass, ferns, and moss, all the green things on the land, generating oxygen, capturing carbon dioxide, driving the great food webs, including what we consume as animals. It starts with photosynthesis. And as a botanist, I am basically a botanist. We used to have a bumper sticker that said, have you thanked a green plant today? <laughs> because without green plants, without photosynthesis, where would we be? I mean, we, we need that process to generate the food that we and most other animals, except now we know there's another process called chemosynthesis, especially in the dark, not entirely, but in the deep sea, in the water column, where bacteria, fungi, a, a whole category of life that we didn't know existed, a kingdom of life, the archaea. They're bacteria-like in appearance, but so different from bacteria that they warrant separation as a whole kingdom of life, but they too engage in this miraculous process called chemosynthesis in the absence of light, stitching together the chemicals that pr produce food. Uh, but I do love the critters in the ocean that photosynthesize, the kelp and other seaweeds. That is kind of my specialty in terms of being a scientist. But the heavy lifting is done by the really small creatures, some of them only recently discovered. I mean, well, at least as I measure time, 1986 was not that long ago. <laughs> For some of you who weren't born yet, but nonetheless. <laughs> 
that's the very year that we stopped killing whales commercially. 1986 was kind of a big year for um, changes in our behavior. First of all, knowing that Prochlorococcus, a little organism that is so tiny that it escaped notice until 1986. Now we know it generates well, maybe as much as 20% of the oxygen in the atmosphere drives along with diatoms and coccolithophorids and a lot of other small creatures that are just beginning to be incorporated in everyday language. Why not? They keep you alive. Don't you think we should show them some respect, learn their names, and say, thank you, Prochlorococcus. <laughs> I breathe because of you. <laughs> and they also contribute food to the zooplankton, which is enormously abundant carbon-based units. What does that mean? We're all carbon-based units. When you, what are we made of? The same basic mix of chemicals that, that are found throughout life and the same basic recipes for, for the chemistry of life. <laughs> the, the great miracle is that with all of the common ground that we share with all other living things from trees to bacteria and everything in between, we have this capacity to be different. I mean, really different. Each of us, we know we're all different. And we now have it verified with not just fingerprints, but the DNA. The miracle is that it, it's true throughout all other forms of life. Cats, dogs, horses, fish, whales, phytoplankton, zooplankton capacity for distinctiveness as well as the common chemistry that we share across the living planet. I just love the fact that now intrepid divers and explorers are getting out there, down there in the ocean, getting acquainted with our neighbors, getting acquainted with our long ago or even now relatives. These are forms of life and we're one big family of life on this miracle of a planet in a universe, as far as we know, does not have life. But for sure, there are no squids elsewhere, or elephants, or humans. There may be life out there somewhere, I hope so. I mean, the common uh, elements that are throughout the universe. But there is no place, there cannot be a place just like what we have here after four and a half billion years of fine tuning with life acting on the rocks and the water and creating these miraculous creatures ultimately, including ourselves. But we are relative newcomers. The wonderful thing about the ocean is the diversity of life that's there, greater than anything anywhere on the land. I mean, we do celebrate the great diversity of insects, and we should or the trees and rainforests, and we should. But all things considered, when you look at all of the many variations on the theme of life, diving into the ocean is like diving into the history of life on Earth, because all of these major segments are out there, down there. Only about half have representation on the land. So it's taken us a while, largely, in my lifetime, this discovery, oh, it's the ocean. The ocean is where the action is. If, you, if you're an alien wanting to see what's going on to make Earth what Earth is, you'd probably bypass the continents altogether and dive right into the ocean and get to know creatures that only occur there, nowhere on the land. The greatest abundance and diversity of life is out there, down there. And the other cool thing is most of it lives in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> the average depth of the ocean, after all, is, you know, two and a half miles, about the depth where the Titanic rests on the seafloor. The maximum, seven miles, 11 kilometers. And we're just beginning to, to even map the ocean with the same degree of detail that exists for the moon and Mars and Jupiter. And Again, in the book, it was fun to look at these, these facts, these, these, getting a grip on what, not only what we know, 
but what don't we know? And having films like The Octopus Teacher land right now in the middle of all this ferment of discovery and ex exploration and change, to look at octopuses with a different attitude. If you haven't seen My Octopus Teacher, by all means, check it out. Dive in and learn to think like an octopus, <laughs> if you can, or at least try to understand their world. And if you don't have to stop there, you know, you can think like tuna, you can imagine <laughs> what it's like to live your life where, you know, half the time it's roughly dark, but below about a thousand feet or so. It's dark all of the time, and life prospers there. It's where most of life on Earth actually lives. And we're more familiar with the sunlit portion because that's where we basically have had access throughout our history. But that is changing, and it couldn't happen fast enough so that we can really appreciate the nature of these systems. They keep us alive. The surface alone doesn't do it because it's anchored in this full water column. The ocean is alive. It's not just water. It's a living system. So, getting to understand that, what a, what a kick to see in ways that we couldn't see before. And to realize that, you know, it starts with photosynthesis up in the sunlit portion of the planet, but then it goes to little critters, insects on the land and other small things that are consumed by the bigger things. And in the ocean, the, the zooplankton, the small fish, squid and the like, and then bigger fish. And ultimately, oh, I've done it. You can be a witness to the food web in action. This is the carbon cycle in action. The goods being passed from one creature to another and nutrients being pushed back into the system. Birds used to do this on the land when the mighty flocks would darken the skies and put nutrients back as they flew around, consuming insects. It's a similar kind of system that you're seeing in action. There goes a tuna. But there are also birds coming in from the top. And, of course, sharks. And it was great to be witnessing that without actually being part of the food web. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the biggest creatures on the planet, whales. Big carbon-based units. 2020, at the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund released a study. They being monetary fund, they follow the money, but they're now following the carbon as it relates to money and climate, looking at whales as carbon-based units that capture and hold, like trees, massive amounts of carbon. And in this climate-conscious time, where is the carbon? So the economists follow the money, the scientists follow the carbon. And here was a convergence of following the carbon and putting a dollar sign on it as it relates to climate. A trillion dollars, big T trillion, the value of whales as they relate to capturing carbon, holding it in the ocean, and therefore not releasing it into the atmosphere, contributing to the carbon dioxide issue that we now face. So, if it works for whales, hmm, what about tuna? What about sharks? What about shrimp and krill, crabs, you name it? They and we are all carbon-based units, but keeping them in the ocean really counts in terms of the carbon cycle and climate. At the COP26 conference just a short time ago, blue carbon, the carbon in the ocean was a headline, and it's increasingly taken into account. We get it. Cutting trees, clear-cutting forests, burning forests, not only contributes carbon dioxide, soot, methane also is released into the atmosphere through some of the actions we are doing to the land, but in the ocean it's similar. When we clear-cut the fish, as we have in an unprecedented way since the middle of the 20th century, we're not talking about feeding families and communities. It's the industrial extraction of wild animals by the ton, wildlife, that is now having an impact 
on the ocean, the, the chemistry of the ocean, and therefore the chemistry of the planet. Technology has given us an edge, not only over all other creatures. I mean, think about elephants are really smart, but they haven't been up in the sky to look back on the Earth. They don't know how old the Earth is. They don't have the capacity that geologists have have generated over the years. Figure out how old this planet is by using technology that's been developed over the ages. But even our own species did not know what is now known. It's so important to realize how lucky we are to be informed with the knowledge that now exists that did not and could not exist until right about now. So going high in the sky, yay. We've got information. Satellites are up there gathering information. People going down deep in the sea, I feel so lucky to be among those who could put on something like, it looks like an astronaut suit in a way, to go deep in the ocean and to see the diversity and abundance of life there and to try to make the connections that we, we now can do and could not do before. Living underwater, staying in one place long enough to get acquainted with the creatures who live there kind of one-on-one, -on -one, the way you can here at the Baltimore National Aquarium. You get to give names to the, that fish that you see day in, day out. And you see that they have faces. They behave differently. They, they have gatherings. You know, the spade fish kind of swim together. They could swim anywhere in this big captive ocean, but they don't. They stick together. And you see that in various species, not all. Some of them prefer a solitary kind of existence, except when they get together to hoop it up to make more fish. But <laughs> living underwater, that I had a chance to do for the first time in, in 1970, two weeks, well, it doesn't seem like much when compared to, say, Jane Goodall, who spent years, day and night, learning, really focusing on one species, one of our fellow primates, chimpanzees. But through her observations, we really have changed our attitude about animals generally in ways that, but for that long, in-depth look to see that chimpanzees have families. They feel pain, they feel pleasure. They have, being able to look through generations, moms, dads, you know, grandparents, kids, grandkids, and to realize that they are all individuals, but they all together form this, this, this family. And they affect the forest around them, and the forest around them affects them. I mean, it's, it should be so obvious. And it carries over into the ocean, but it's less obvious in the ocean because we have historically, and even now, been able to spend far less time getting to know individual places, individual species, families, generations. There are some exceptions. One of them, Randy Wells, is a scientist who's been studying dolphins. And he's been consulting with John and other members of the staff here about your dolphins and what it would take to give them a, a, a bigger home out there somewhere beyond where they have spent years. And now that we know about what we might be able to do to give them a better life, before we knew, you can't care if you don't know. I mean, you might know and not care. <laughs> but like this institution is all about knowing that leads to caring. And I hope that the book, The Ocean Odyssey, will help open some eyes and hearts and minds to know better about the nature of life in the sea so that maybe we can care more. It, it's not just my looking and my experiences. One of the great things about writing the Odyssey book and a lot of help from Barbara and her allies and mine to get stories, profiles of explorers, of visionaries, of scientists, and the difference that they are making maybe a source of inspiration for some of others. Maybe some of you can see what somebody else is doing, say, I, I, I like that. 
That, that could be me. And why not? We now have the capacity to do so much that was not possible not so long ago. Living underwater, getting into little submarines, exploring this planet from the inside out. It's there to be done. And if you think it's unlike, oh, I couldn't do that. Well, if I can do it, you can be assured. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> it can't be that hard. I mean, I'm not Superman, obviously, nor, nor Superwoman. Um, <laughs> my brother reminds me that everybody's taller than you are, Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> so but I, I love seeing some of the kids who are here who, who, who can still look up to me. <laughs> <laughs> but being in the ocean, looking down into the depths of the sea, and to see the creatures looking back. I spent, starting 1977, a full year working with Roger Payne and other scientists who were studying whales. And we thought we were going to go study the whales, watch the whales like these fish. <laughs> the whales turned out to watch us. And as divers, I know that many of you in the audience are divers. And even if you aren't, dive into this aquarium. Go look at a fish and you'll find them looking right back at you. you know, who are you? you know, who's your mama? Who's your daddy? <laughs> Where'd you come from? <laughs> and to realize that there's somebody home in that big body or small creature, whoever it is. And that our attitude of just looking at them as pounds of meat uh, or barrels of oil in the case of whales or some of the fish like Menhaden, we're, we just have been so complacent and so unfeeling. We, we need a greater, we need a you know, magic wand to sweep across humanity with empathy, with understanding, of course, for other forms of life but why not to other humans as well? <laughs> Little submarines are giving us again the gift of time and depth, as John pointed out in the sweeping introduction, that among the first things we began discussing many years ago was how do we get down there in the ocean? How do we take ourselves, you know, fragile human beings, and explore the depths, and do it in ways that are so simple that even a scientist can drive one of these things. And that was the goal, and it, it's possible. We had over a five-year period with the National Geographic and the Goldman Foundation and NOAA collaborating with dozens of other institutions and supporters to use little submarines to go around the coastline of the United States into the marine sanctuaries and to set baseline information, to go where no people had ever been before, not because we didn't want to go, but we just couldn't get there. And even if you could get even to 100 feet, you couldn't stay very long. In one of these little submarines, I spent the night at 100 feet off the coast of Mexico just watching the creatures. But you can do that here in the aquarium, spend the night and get to see the creatures. What do they do at night? Well, I'll find out. <laughs> And now, generations, new submersibles are being built. I love the fact that we are coming along. It's like the early days of flight, to be able to descend into the depths. I had the pleasure of taking my grandsons, two of them. I have four grandsons, I had two of them, in a little submarine, back to the place in Hawaii, where I walked around with that big gym suit that looks like an astronaut suit, and with a fourth million ISO Canon camera could capture as and, and on film that you're seeing now bioluminescence of the corals that I could see and touch and talk about, but I couldn't share the view. But actually one of my grandsons took these images and is sharing the view of what we now can do. We can take photographs in the dark. We can look at the phenomenon, bioluminescence, that is characteristic of most of life on Earth out there in the ocean. On the order of 90% of the creatures in the deep sea have some form of bioluminescence. And now we can go there and be witnesses and learn so much 
that was not possible to learn or know about not so long ago. So I'm embarked as usual. <laughs> John knows I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep after the idea of building little submarines because I want all of you to be able to go check out a, you know, why not Hertz Renesub or <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe you want to keep one in your garage and tow it out and you know take the plunge and realize that that's where the action is out there in the ocean. So stand by. <laughs> More to come. Actually, you know, we are witnesses right now. This is Jim Cameron, just as he has returned from the deepest place in the ocean in 2012. The first descent to the deepest place was 52 years before. I mean, 1960. It's just hard to imagine that it's taken us so long to take the technology that does exist and apply it to getting to know this part of the solar system, this part of the universe. I mean, I love it, the fact that we're looking skyward and we're going high beyond our own atmosphere, beyond our own solar system, the secrets of the universe. But this part of the universe is still largely a mystery. So come on, it's up to you. We gotta get out there, we gotta go down there, we gotta go exploring. Okay, you don't like to get wet, or you don't like to get into a submarine. So you can send a messenger, you can send these robots, and sit warm and dry, you know, flying these machines. My fellow National Geographic explorer, Bob Ballard, is one of the real champions, the pioneers in, in using robots to go exploring. While well, he sits on the deck of the ship, maybe in a lawn chair, drinking something nice and cool, while enjoying ocean exploration remotely. Well, that technology that has served us so well in terms of exploring and understanding and knowing, is, it's double-edged. We've also used a remarkable capacity to use technology to consume nature, to consume oil, gas, coal from deep within the earth, non-renewable ancient systems converted to oil, gas, and coal that we're now burning to power civilization to new levels of prosperity. Probably the most important thing is those fossil fuels have delivered, as helpful as they have been in terms of so much that we take for granted, that the, the energy that now powers civilization globally from where we were a hundred years ago, let alone 500 or a thousand, but it's knowledge, knowledge that we have to change. Imagine if we didn't know, but we do know that burning fossil fuels, as helpful as it has been, is also causing problems, real problems, climate change. I had a, an opportunity to work with the Earth Observatory in Singapore to create this little it's just a snippet of a documentary about climate change brought about largely because of our actions, altering the nature of nature. I mean, I, I love to stand in New York City and wonder what was there a thousand years ago and look at it now because of the technologies that we have developed that make it possible for us to convert nature into whatever it is that we want to put in its place. But you know, it's miraculous. It's really something commendable that we can do all this. But enough is enough. We are now changing so much of the natural world that we're putting our own future at risk. And we can see it in the lives of creatures that preceded us by many millions of years, their future now very much on the line, whether it's one of the world to the other whether there will be penguins or polar bears in the next century, it really depends on what we do or fail to do right now. We've already seen it, certainly on my watch, about half the coral reefs are either gone or in a state of sharp decline, partly because of global warming, partly because of the changing chemistry, acidification of the ocean, as excess carbon dioxide becomes carbonic acid and changing the world and changing it so fast, like geological change 
in my lifetime. I'm a witness. I've seen this particular reef out on the Coral Sea when it was just ablaze with color and life, and now a desolate place that looks like a ghost town. But there's a lot of good news, too. The fact that there are more whales today <laughs> than when I was a kid. Why? Well, how about we stop killing them? Largely. <laughs> it makes a difference when you, when you start caring and see with new eyes the value of life that shares this miraculous blue speck in the universe. We have yet to get it with respect to sharks. Whales have increased, but sharks have decreased, 90% or so. With some species, like the oceanic white tip, maybe 1% remain from what was there in the middle of the 20th century, when I first began exploring the ocean. I used to be kind of wary when I'd go into the ocean and I'd see so many sharks. Now I worry, and I'm wary, <laughs> because I don't see sharks. There, it's just one of those things. We can do better. Uh, taking hundreds of millions of sharks for shark fins or for shark soup or whatever it is that you want to take them for because some people think it's fun to kill sharks or because they get caught incidentally on hooks that are intended for other species that are also in trouble. You know, now we know. That's the good news. And the better news is taking this knowledge and turning it around. I mean, people were getting to know whale sharks up close and personal as individuals. No two whale sharks have the same pattern of spots. Who knew that? Until people started taking pictures and comparing and realizing you can name every shark and know who he or she might be just by looking at the freckles on their back. Oh. Or we could turn them like we turn whales into chunks of meat and oil. We were doing it with so many wild animals from the sea, oblivious to the real impact we're having on ocean wildlife. It's one thing when you're, you know, feeding your families, feeding your communities, using methods that don't involve factory trawlers or factory taking industrial scale extraction of wildlife just huge nets that strip the ocean of life. But it, it's happening, and it's happening on our watch right now. We can do something about it through the choices we make, through the people that we put into power, the laws that we, we in, either uh, change or, or sometimes initiate so that we protect life in the ocean to a far greater scale than is happening today. This is Monterey, and all those boats, they're just little boats. And people say, well, they're just little boats. But look how many of them there are, each with a net catching what? Squid. Squid have very little protection anywhere in the world. But after looking at octopus teacher or coming here to the aquarium, getting to know squid up close and personal, you might think differently about calamari. <laughs> you might, you might not, but certainly you won't if you don't know what an incredible force they are in the ocean, how important they are to the food chains in the ocean, or how important they are as individuals, how smart they are, and how everyone is its own special individual creature. By dismembering ocean systems, and we've done it mostly in the last 100 years, particularly in the last 50, and the pace is picking up of taking ocean wildlife, stripping away the tunas, the swordfish, the sharks, the grouper, the snapper, and now even the parrotfish are being removed from coral reefs. Okay, so along comes a newcomer in the Atlantic, brought in who knows exactly how lionfish got into the Atlantic, but they're not a part of the history in recent years anyway, but they've suddenly exploded and filling a niche that has now opened up with all the big grouper gone, all the snappers gone, all the sharks gone. 
there's a place for these little guys to come in and, and have nobody there to eat them. They have just an open season on all the little creatures that they are now apex predators and know nothing ab above them to keep them in line, which would be the case in a natural, healthy ecosystem. What are we going to do about it? Go out and try to spear them until they're gone? No, they're so abundant. They're down to far below where spear, spear fishermen go, even a thousand feet down. There are many lionfish. I've seen them for myself in little submarines out in the Gulf of Mexico. So, restore health. It's not a matter of killing the lionfish. It's not killing the other fish that keep these reefs and systems healthy. Give them a break. It's not likely that people are going to stop killing fish for food, but the very least we can do is say, this area, this chunk of reef, this place, we're going to safeguard everything here, including the groupers, including the lobsters, including everything, to have intact systems to restore damaged areas and to really bring health back to the ocean, to the corals. Oh, and oh, by the way, it's not just what we're taking out of the ocean, it's what we're putting into the ocean. And, you know, you are all witnesses to this, the avalanche of, of what we have created. And the cool thing is, when you go into a natural system, whether it's on the land or in the ocean, where's the waste? Natural systems don't have waste. Everything is converted to somebody else's treasure. But we have this habit of creating stuff that we throw away, or, you know, we think there's a, an away. This uh, crafty albatross is taking advantage of some of the junk we've thrown into the ocean to make nesting materials, but it's a little sad that she's had to resort to this. So here we are, 21st century human beings. And I love basically having had the chance to kick back in 2020 and look at like this overview. What do we know about the ocean? What are we doing to the ocean? You know, the book is kind of arranged in, into sections. The first part is about what do we know about the ocean, about water, the physical nature of past, present, and future ocean. The center part is all about the nature of the diversity of life. But the last part is really where I hope all of you will take some time to think about our relationship, your relationship to the ocean. How does the ocean affect you every day? With every breath you take, of course, but otherwise. Imagine if there were no ocean. <laughs> we couldn't be here. But and also, not how the ocean affects you, but what are you doing to affect the ocean? And what could be done so that there are more of other creatures, just as today there are more turtles, more whales than there were when I was a kid, because we started more caring, less killing, more manatees than when I was a kid, same thing, less killing, more caring. And around the world, this idea of embracing special places, like national parks. What a brilliant idea. Some say the best idea America ever had. And it's taken over the world, <laughs> one would think. But only about 15% of the land is really highly protected, where nature is allowed to prosper without a great amount of impact from us. In the ocean, this suggests that about 6% as of 2017. The fact is, a recent careful analysis, how much of the ocean is really safeguarded, where lobsters and shrimp and squid and octopus and all the creatures who are natural in an area are really safeguarded. Doesn't mean you can't go there, but just the creatures there, you don't kill them and you don't poison them. You just try your best to keep, it, keep them safe. 3%. 3%, meaning 97% of the ocean is, is not highly or fully protected. We have a long way to go to get to the goal that is now being promoted by nations around the world and individuals and organizations. 30% of the planet, land, and sea safeguarded in the next 10 years by 2030. 
30 by 30 is the hue and cry. It's a good start. But imagine if you send, well, 70% of the planet is up for grabs. No, <laughs> we need to safeguard, highly safeguard, large areas of the land and sea and behave ourselves more responsibly toward all of it, recognizing that our life depends on keeping the planet safe, keeping nature intact, reverse the trend that I've experienced and you're experiencing, all of us are right now, to go in the other direction. So there are a lot of organizations working toward this goal. I mean, the big conservation organizations, World Wildlife, Nature Conservancy, Conservation International, Wildlife Conservation Society, aquariums around the world are joining in this, this effort to safeguard large areas of the ocean to go from where we are to get to a much better place. John mentioned Mission Blue and the goal of having hope spots areas that are not necessarily in great shape, but can be improved by action that champions and communities, countries can take to safeguard large areas of the ocean. Right now, there are nearly 140 places around the world with champions and communities and countries signing on to the idea, we'll get from where we are to get to a better place and from the very beginning of this concept, I think John remembers when I started talking about having hope spots, I think right there in the, in, in the first handful of places, I said, you know, Chesapeake Bay should be a hope spot. And go, come on, look at it. Look at the wealth of knowledge that is there and the opportunity that now exists to go from where it is, we know what it was like 400 years ago, We'll never get back there, but we can make it better through the actions that can be taken right now. So Chesapeake Bay is kind of high on my list for number 141. Hmm. What do you think? I hope you will think about that. <laughs> Max Bellow and Brittany Bellow, with their kids are in the audience here somewhere. <laughs> Yay, there you are. <laughs> And Matt Rand, another of my heroes, yay, with Pew Charitable Trust. Among those, really working for big ideas. And one of the great things to come out of the COP26 conference was the announcement by four countries, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Panama, that they are joining forces, holding hands, if you will, to safeguard a swimway in their coastal offshore waters where turtles and tunas and swordfish and whales, all the creatures that are migratory, will have safe passage. They've made that commitment. Really good news, recognizing the importance of coming together, that many of the creatures in the sea, all of them, none of them, really appreciate our boundaries. But if we can start thinking like an ocean, thinking like life in the ocean, and Matt, and Max, and Britt, and many other colleagues, but working together, but you notably have had influence on that particular announcement and other announcements that are beginning to cause hope around the world. A network of hope as we establish these places where life can prosper, and with it, we have a chance for prospering too. So. That's the big message in Ocean, a global odyssey. Every chapter features a hope spot, and together, looking at what people are doing, the champions, the scientists, the visionaries, of what can be done on our watch. You know, the next 10 years could be the most important in the next 10,000 years because of the chance we have, this sweet spot in time. I hope you will enjoy diving into the book, Ocean, A Global Odyssey. And I do want to share with you just the story that as I was writing the book, and as I was almost every day talking to Barbara on the phone, 
every once in a while she'd hear something in the background and it was like this. <laughs> Our house rooster <laughs> with something to crow about when we finally finished the book. Thank you. Bravo, bravo, bravo. What a wake-up call. <clears throat> and I mean that uh, both figuratively and literally. Um, the rooster will help the wake-up call. <laughs> yes, right. right. <laughs> Got the concept. Okay, well, we're going to move into our, um, our question and answer portion. And if you have been following the technology here, uh, you will have logged on to Slido, and we're going to see some questions start to pop up on the screen above us. Um, again, we're accepting questions on slido.com and the hashtag, it's hashtag Sylvia. So let's start with the first that's got a lot of people asking it or agreeing to it. We ask individuals to be sustainable, though big polluters are corporations and industries. Why aren't they held accountable to the same standards as individuals? Good question. I'll put it right back to you. What do you think? <laughs> I mean... This is the time, I, th I think the, it is up to us to hold the person you see in the mirror accountable, but society, we, we, ha we have to change if we're going to succeed going forward, and we can, and, and, it, and it is happening. I, I, for every time I have this little moment of, of despair, it's countered ten times over by something that lifts my spirits. The, 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 what's happening now with protected areas, with like the octopus teacher, for heaven's sakes, that you're getting people to see things differently. Or maybe you, if you haven't seen my life as a turkey, <laughs> I suggest that you check it out. We're looking at other forms of life with compassion, with a different approach than just thinking of them as products or as pieces of meat. Um, and it will go a long way if we can look at one another with compassion and empathy to see the world. You know, all the great religions say we should do unto others as we would have them do unto us. So why not do unto tuna as we would have tuna do unto you? <laughs> and please don't eat me. <laughs> Appreciate me for who I am. Well, Pogo said, we've met the enemy and it is us, but I, th I think we can also be our most important friend, too, and I know you feel right. that way. Well, what skills do you think young people need to be equipped with to be able to make actionable changes to improve the health of the ocean? A two-by-four. <laughs> Whack. <laughs> Start with your mom and dad. No, we're kidding, kidding. <clears throat> well, and isn't it about, I mean, it's... One of the things that can be equipped with is a sense of hope, that, that in spite of all the painful things we've heard, there's a whole lot to be hopeful for. Yeah. We know more. It's knowledge. It really is. I <laughs> attended a conference in Washington about global security, and I heard this crusty, mini-spangled general <laughs> kind of get up and say in a really gruff, general-like voice, you know, what, what we really need is an education bomb. <laughs> it's, I mean, I, I was taken aback, but it's knowing. And we're getting there. We, it, it, the, the, it, one thing I wish I could do is to, you know, while we learn our letters and numbers, Make sure at the earliest possible age, and if, it, if you don't get it in schools, come to an aquarium. Uh, do whatever it takes, but learn that we're a part of nature and figure out what air is. I mean, we don't have to figure it out. Somebody's done that. Just ask the questions and make it a part of your life. Never 
stop asking questions. Kids do it naturally. Why would we ever stop? Don't stop. That was what was so inspiring about meeting the Black Girls Dive uh, delegates today. Yes. And learning about how they're learning how to tag, you know, hammerhead sharks and follow them on the internet and, and learning techniques and technologies that they can do. And these are nine and 10, 11 year old girls. I think that inspired me yeah, more yeah. than anything. They're right here in front of us. Who says girls can't dive? <laughs> when are you just going to run this joint? Well, let's talk about... Uh, oh, good. Let's get into one here that a lot of people have asked, which is... Um, uh, can you please tell us about one of your most fascinating experiences from your impressive career? <laughs> it's always the next thing that's out there. <laughs> it's the, you know, you can look back at diving with whales or living underwater or whatever, but it's, it's the, the lure is you never know what's going to happen next, but you know it's going to be good. So, I on, love that's your, that's your answer to your favorite dive spot too, right? Your, your, uh -huh. What's your best dive? The next one. <laughs> uh, okay, here's a good one. Um, and, and kind of on the topic of the young ladies that we were just talking about. Advice you'd offer for marine science majors seeking work? Seeking work? Wow. You know, just be really good at whatever it is you're doing. I mean, polish those skills, whatever they are. And there will be a place for you if you're really good at something. <laughs> and it's not just in science. And find something that you really love and are willing to do even if you don't find an immediate place of employment. Just keep at it. And doors will open that you don't expect if you really make it your, follow your passion, if you will. I know it sounds corny, but it's also true. It sounds real. And, and, it's, and it doesn't have to be science. It's true with music or art or math or whatever. What, what, be really good at it. But at the same time, I strongly urge everyone, no matter who you are or what you call yourself or what you think you <laughs> specialty, realize that we are all connected. And no, nobody can do everything, but it takes everybody doing something and being pretty good at something to make society work, to make your life work. And figure out where you really want to put your time and energy. Don't wait for somebody to ask you or hire you, <laughs> but just m make yourself as good as you can about that thing that makes your come on fire, that, that you love to do, that doesn't seem like work. That's, and then you know you're on path. Mm -hmm. It was only a few years before I met you, I was scrubbing tanks as a diver at a marine park in California and wondering, <laughs> where is this leading? <laughs> well, it led to the wall, and then I had to do yeah. another row. <laughs> But somehow that led to other things, and we're sitting here tonight, yeah. and I get to hang share the stage with, with Hang her. out with people who are doing what you want to do, even if you're not getting paid. And just make right. a nuisance of yourself. <laughs> Did you make a nuisance of yourself, yeah, Good John? nuisance. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here comes a trick question, because I think I know the answer. <clears throat> it's from Andrew, age eight. What is your favorite sea creature? A live one. <laughs> <laughs> That's so easy. Not a trick at all. Yeah. <clears throat> and well, your favorite one, species? One other answer, though, is I'm looking at them. You know, we're all sea creatures, and I'm a human being. And I do have kids, and I have grandkids, and I really care about them. And I care about my species. We're all as dependent on the ocean as any starfish or whale or coral reef. So, wise up. <laughs> sea creatures. <laughs> Be a sea star. Yeah, right. 
Dr. Earl, I'm a first grade teacher in a small town in Maryland, and I'd like to ask your advice on how I can advise my students to help protect the ocean every day. Asking the question is a good place to start. And whether you're six years old or 60 years old, <laughs> look in the mirror and ask that question and ask, what am I good at? What do I like? And then take that something and apply it in a way that will make a difference for the ocean. Maybe it's a choice about what to eat or not. Maybe it's getting to know some creature in the sea very well, like the octopus teacher, or like Jane Goodall and the chimpanzees, or like my life as a turkey. <laughs> Choose some creature, even if you can't be out there day and night. Dive into the books that are there to get to know who are these creatures. One of the best things about the Global Odyssey book <laughs> was for, given the opportunity to have this big centerfold showing the diversity of life in the ocean. Representatives of these different kinds of creatures that, that most people have not yet seen, but they're there to be seen. You could become the world's expert on pink nagandids, sea spiders. They're such cool creatures. And they're not everywhere, but you could learn, you could become the expert on arrow worms, or on peanut worms, or spoon worms, or, you know, there's so many different categories of, that, tardigrades, little uh, water bears that occur on the land as well as in this, wherever there's water, you find water bears. They're tiny little creatures, but they're so cute. They look like little bears, and they're very hardy. It, it, we, they need your help. They need your intelligence. They need people to really understand who they are and go traipse around and find them. You can find them in the moss in the cracks, in the cement, in the sidewalk. You can find them in the bark of trees. You can find them in seaweed. You can find them living in the grains of sand on the beach. But you have to know what to look for. You can make it a, a quest, like a treasure hunt. Anyway, I, sorry, I digress. <laughs> you can be the expert on something that nobody knows much about and really become that person that the world comes to find out about whatever it is. As you once said to me in a kelp forest with fronds like you, who needs anemones? <laughs> uh, oh, anemone. Uh. <laughs> Do we have time for a couple more, Jenny? One more? Okay, well, let's that was, see. That was, <laughs> we should end on that one. No, no. <laughs> let the air right out of the balloon. Um, uh, okay, no, uh, let's see here. Well, then we have to pick one, don't we? God. Uh, we'll take the one at the top. Over the span of your long career, what are the biggest changes that you've seen in the world's oceans? Well, the two big categories about how much we have learned, really, Rachel Carson wrote this beautiful book called The Sea Around Us, published in 1951. That's when I was just beginning to put my face in the water as a would-be marine scientist and, and to see life under the surface for the first time. Jacques Cousteau, that was, I, I, Silent World was just so inspiring to me. And even before that, reading William Beebe's book, Half Mile Down, his descriptions of the bioluminescence of creatures that flash and sparkle and glow. I really wanted to do that. It stuck with me and until I finally was doing that, and I am doing that still. So it's what we've learned. That Rachel Carson didn't know that continents move around. Nobody really understood the mechanism that, that makes it possible for the <laughs> the continents to shift and move, the existence of the hydrothermal vents, new discoveries in the late 1970s, and we're finding new 
things, new areas of hydrothermal vents and new discoveries about life, this whole new kingdom of life that nobody knew about until the 1970s. What else is out there, down there, that you're going to find that somebody will discover and revolutionize the way we think? And coupled that with the magnitude of loss, I mean, it's dreadful. I, you know, if I had my way, I'd be either hunched over a hot microscope or out there diving day in, day out, following my vision and my, you know, I, I want to know what's going on down there. But I find myself instead doing more and more of what I'm doing right here, right now, of trying to get others to see what has happened and to motivate them to go see for themselves and to recognize that this is, as never before, the best time to understand what's going on because as never again we have this opportunity. It, it could get a lot worse really fast if we don't make the transition from decline to recovery. But I see so much happening that's positive. I'm really inspired and I especially am inspired by the kids. Thank you, girls. Thank you, kids over there. Thank you, Benji, Willow, Rio, all of you. And the kid that's in every one of you, however many decades old you are. Especially you, John. <laughs> well, now we're getting into ancient stuff. <laughs> Well, I, you know, if you know Sylvia, and I think some of you have gotten to know her a bit, um, not only would we all love to go on all night, but she'd outlast us. <laughs> but I'm told we can't. And so um, with, with that, I think we're going to bid our online audience adieu. We're going to thank you all for joining us. Um, remember to uh, keep, keep looking uh, uh, at our website, aqua.org, for answers to some of these questions. We'll continue to post some of these and especially the answers that Sylvia has provided, um, especially in her fabulous new book, one of many that she's written to enlighten us all. Um, so again, goodbye to our online audience, and thank you.